of old times for you now. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Bring back a lot of memories? Yeah, bring back a lot of memories. You know, but it is what it is. You know. Good? Roy, what are some of your, uh, you've got some terrific fights here in Las Vegas. If you look back, and, and what, are, what are maybe two of your, what are a couple of your favorite moments in Vegas? Fights um, that come here? A couple of my favorite moments, my of course, well, my first favorite moment was beating James Tony in 1994 at MGM Grand because that was the time that I stepped on the block to beat the big guy on the block. And when I can't beat the big guy on the block, he definitely was the big guy on the block. He was the man that was the man at the time. So it's like a lot of people think that I dig stuff from nowhere to say nowadays when I'm talking about boxing, when I'm talking about pound for pound fighters, when I'm talking about different things. But it's like I don't dig, I want to go from my knowledge and my experience. You feel me? So when James Turner, when I fought James Turner, James Turner was the man. Had I fought the same fight that I fought with Bernard Hopkins and I beat him every round, but I really didn't just, I mean, I beat him easy every round, but I didn't make it, I didn't take no risk because I didn't have to. I beat him so easy, it didn't make sense to take a gamble. And he was not the man, he was just the guy who was fighting for the middleweight title. So I safely, smartly took him apart with one hand. With James, on the other hand, it was a little bit different. When you approach pound for pound supremacy, you got to dominate that other guy, or you're not really pound for pound the best. It's still a question. Who, like right now, we still don't really know who the best fighter out of Triple G and Canelo Ever is. Why? Because nobody dominated. Right? After the first fight with Warden Kobala, we still arguing about who won the fight. Why? Because nobody dominated. Well, if don't nobody dominate, then you don't deserve to take the man's title. Because he is the man. For you to be in his fight, you got to prove that you can dominate him. If you can't dominate him, then why should we give you his fight? Because we know what he can do. He already proved himself. So when I came in 94 to beat James Tony, I came to beat the man. And it was so bad for me that when he fought Iran Barkley, they wrote him and said, you got 10 days to let us know whether you want to keep the middleweight title or the super middleweight title, right? When I signed to fight him, because I want to give the fans the fight they want to see, they want to see who can beat the man right now, I was stripped of my title right away. I didn't get no chance to say, okay, if I beat James, I got 10 days to tell them whether I want to stay tight. No, they stripped me of my title as soon as I signed to fight James. But that's how sure I was that I was going to beat Jamie. That's how sure I was that I was the man at the time. I said, y'all take that. I ain't going to need them to have this one anyway. So y'all take that. And that's what happened. Right. But my second member was John Reese. That, because that was something that God gave me that I never dreamed of having. I never thought that I would even fight for a world heavyweight title because I never was a heavyweight. I turned professional as a junior heavyweight. So I never thought in a million years I would ever be even thinking about fighting for a heavyweight title. Yes, right, I'm just going to say, it was kind of a surprise announcement for all of us. I mean, for you to be fighting again, and then not only do that, but to fight on UFC Fight Pass. Can you just talk about how this whole thing came together? <clears throat> well, I can say this for any kids, anybody that watch, this is a true story, a true testament. When they say you, you reap what you sow, that's a very true statement. Because back in 94, when I was on the tour to fight James Tony, a kid came up to me and said, could he go down to the arcade? and play games with me on the press tour. And I'm finna fight the baddest man I ever fought in my life. You know who that kid was? Dana White. So now, I'm at the end of my career. He's thriving in his career. Look who came back to give me something I never thought I'd see. My fight, my last fight on UFC Fight Pass. No boxer has fallen on UFC Fight Pass yet. So when they tell you, you reap what you sow, be careful what you sow, because you will reap that. And you should sow good seeds, therefore you reap good seeds. I never saw this coming. But that's a true statement of you reap what you sow. You know, I took him in, we hung out, we played games, we did our thing. I didn't even really remember him at the time. He came to me later on and said, you remember that kid you hung out with during that press tour? Because I don't do things to remember it. I do things because that's who I am. You understand me? So when I do a good deed, I don't write that down in my, ma my memory that I did that for you. I don't care. You know who knows I did that? You and God knows. That's all that matters to me. But he remembered. So he came back and what are you doing for me right now? Pretty amazing when you, I mean, to be here today and look at like, I mean, you've seen MMA come up from nothing and now you're here in this, you know, multi-million dollar facility. You never know what God has in store for him. I never knew at that time that that's when he actually was talking to my people back then about them trying to get involved because that I wasn't the talk guy they were and I couldn't really make the decision because they was doing it, it was their money, they was doing their thing and I know that they hate now that they didn't do like I did and put him in because look what he has grown us into. So. You what, mentioned when you fought Ruiz. Yep. Now, Andre Ward, Put on some weight. He talked about specifically mentioned you doing that as uh, something he wants to do as well. Do you think he could be successful with that? Well, you never can say what a person can be <laughs> successful at doing because nobody ever thought would have thought that I could have done. It. 
So I'll tell you, if I done it, I think, of course he should be able to do it because it is not easy. But I know who Andre is. And with the fight, with the tenacity, with the heart that he has, it's like when we go out to set these marks, we set them for these guys under us to try to follow the top or even set it even higher. So for him, he's a guy who has came up and watched me set a mark. He wants to go even higher because if he wins the heavyweight title, He's gonna do probably what I didn't do, which is win the cruiserweight title too. You feel me? So he can take the mark a step even higher. So I don't see why he couldn't be able to do it. I mean, it's not gonna be easy, but if anybody could do it, I think it would be him. Roy right, Anderson Silva used to throw out your name quite often. I wonder how how interested were you in that at the time, and, and how close did that ever come to happen? <laughs> well, man, to be honest with you, I was so interested because I knew that just like the Conor McGregor Mayweather fight trying to be one of the best events of all time. I knew that the Roy Jones Jr. Anderson Silva event would have been one of the best events of all time. So when you talk boxing, it's one thing. When you talk MMA fighting, it's another thing. But when you talk events, it's a whole nother light. And so many people from that world, because they know that he idolized and watched my boxing moves, he even used them sometimes when he fought. And he was a, one of the most superior guys they've had in the UFC. So if he learned from this other superior guy that was in boxing, and he used to box himself anyway, then why would you put him in the ring together just to see what happens? Because it's still something that people want to see. You watch it right now, right? Absolutely. I definitely would watch it right now. If I wouldn't even Roy Jones, I still want to watch it. Because I want to see how good he is at pulling off Roy's tricks and could he use Roy's tricks against him. Yet, I also want to see what Roy come up with different and new because he's copying all Roy's old stuff. You got to come up with some different because stuff you know how to do, he knows it. So it's not going to work on him. So it's more of an event than a boxing match. And then events always outweigh boxing matches. You understand me? It's like back in the days, the Super Bowl was good, the NBA All-Star game was good, I mean NBA championship, the finals is good. If we have an epic game, we have a good game. But when we play the All-Star game, <laughs> you got the best of the best. We all want to see how that happens. How they will merge on the court. How will this guy and this guy play together? How will that guy and that guy stop this guy? And it's stuff we can't dream of. That makes it an event. That's what makes it so fun and so big. So now it's kind of taking the fun out of it because they don't go as hard as they used to back then. But back then, we got to see a dream once a year. We got to see sometimes Larry and Dr. J play together against some other people when we used to see them butt heads. You understand me? Mm -hmm. So that's what events do. And so an and event like that will probably still put me out of the town. Did that still... fight come close or why didn't it happen? Mm -hmm. Dana's the man with that. He had other plans usually for Anderson when I was trying to make it happen. So when you have a plan, when a guy draws out like, like this whole compound, this was something that you plan to do. When a guy has a plan, it's kind of hard to change the plan because he already got a plan drawn out. So most of the time when I ask him about the fight, he already had a plan or something that he's working on trying to do. I don't get it wrong, sometimes different things, different attributes play a factor in those plans and you don't get to do it the way you want to do it or the way you want to do it. So sometimes the things that he had planned did not mature. But it was never a time that when they didn't mature, we could go and make our fight happen because usually when he said he had plans, I went on and did something else. Is so that still a fight that interests you? Of course it is because like I just said, it's not a fight, it's an event. Events always interest me. And because we were trying to do it before they did. So of course it's a, event. It's a huge event that interests both of us. So you would come out of retirement for that fight? Of course I would. Why not? And I would get in top shape and be ready to win it because I'm not planning on losing nothing. The only thing I want to lose is wait. Has Dana brought that up? We really haven't had a chance to talk about it yet. Late as of late, we, we was trying to put this together first because he is trying to get into boxing and putting UFC fight pass at Roy Jones on UFC fight pass in a boxing match was a big step toward getting him into the boxing arena. So that's what we've been talking about first. But quite naturally, I'm sure that will come up because I know Anderson still wants it, and if he wants it, of course I still want it because, like I said, it's not a boxing match per se; it's an event. What do you think of Dana White getting into boxing? I think it's a brilliant idea because he has a lot of things that he's learned from the UFC by doing things his own way. Brought the UFC to a spot where boxing never has gotten to yet. You understand me? So it's like with those with those different ways of looking at it, you bring new blood, new ideas to a game, you're gonna make that game go up even more. So I look forward to him coming to boxing because I think with that, we can take boxing and take it up even another level. You think he'll pull some of the UFC fans over? Of course he will, because, like I said, even with these events like this, that pulls some of the UFC fans over already because of the events. So now you can help this side get better and this side get better, 
you can have an even big event at the top when you do decide to put an event together. So why would he not? You have your own promotion company. Do you see yourself working with them in some of your events? Of course. Of course. That's why we're doing it now. That's what my whole goal is to put us together so we can work better. If you know, it's like everything I do is always to help people come together and work better. You know, it's like people say, you got Russian citizenship. We I got Russian citizenship because they offer it and they're very nice people. And it's like 90% of the population knows where John Trina is a fighter. So why would we start at a lower level trying to make us come together as people and realize that relationships, being together as people, are more important than war with people? Because if we go to war, we all lose people. We lose loved ones. Why should we war when we don't have to? Why can't we talk and we're humans? We have the best means, the most means of communication, yet we had a hard time communicating. Why? You feel me? That's crazy. So if you got him who's trying to get into boxing, me who's a superior boxer with an already uh, um, promotion company, and I do do MMA and boxing, then why wouldn't we come together and make it better for both of us? It'd be crazy not to. Well, you think boxing's ready for that? For the longest time, it's been boxing versus mixed martial arts. It hasn't been the two communities kind of working together. I know you've promoted cards, but yeah. do you think the community as a whole, as a boxing community, is ready to start embracing MMA? That's a good question, and let me give you a good answer for that question, okay? When you see two guys come together and make over a hundred million dollars, you think it's good for each other? Yes. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Easy answer, right? Yep. Give you a fool. If you didn't support UFC and boxing, because look what y'all can do together. Huh? Conor McGregor made more money than most fighters that fight have made in one night, and he's not a boxer, he's a UFC guy. Why wouldn't you want to come together with UFC because they can make that happen for you? Why wouldn't you bring the two together? How much well, of this event is Zufa Boxing and how much is your promotion? Uh, it's probably 50 50. You know, we, we're doing my promotion too, but of course we want to help Zufa Boxing get their feet wet and get into it the right way. So anything we can do to help Zufa Boxing come on, come on board and go quick, we're going to try to do it. So it's 50 50 to me. Why was the hardest thing, mentally or physically, preparing for a fight at your age? Physically. Uh, mentally, I ain't. Listen. Let me just explain something to people. People always worry about my mental capacity and how I'm going to be. I was crazy when I started boxing. If you can't mess a crazy guy up, you're already crazy, right? So mentally, I ain't never had a problem getting ready to beat somebody's child up. That's just what I did with living always. You put your child out there, I'm going to whoop you. That's what, I was, that's what I was programmed to do when I got here. That's not a problem. Physically, it's very hard for that body to hold up at 49 to what it used to hold up to at 29. So the physical part is the hardest part because you have to keep your body tough in all the preparation and all the things you do to get ready for a fight. That's a long process, which takes a lot of dedication and hard work, but your body has to be able to withstand that hard work or you won't succeed. You mentioned how there's not a clear cut pound for pound number one. A lot of people think it's Crawford, a lot of people think it's Lomachenko. How do you have it ranked? Say that again. The top pound for pound boxer right now. Yep. You mentioned how it's not clear cut like when you were at the top. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people think it's Lomachenko or Crawford. Do you? What's your opinion on who's the best right now? My opinion on that is, it's like, it's as follows. There are a lot of guys that can make that claim to fame. If War comes out of retirement, of course, he should be the one because he beat more people. And he made adjustments to people. He neutralized more guys than anybody. So he would be my number one off the top, right? Um, Lomachenko and um, Crawford would be number 1A and 1B because they fought whoever you fought to them. However, we have not really seen well, we've seen Lomachenko in an adverse situation, and he lost that situation. We haven't seen Crawford really in an adverse situation because nobody been able to push him that yet. So we don't really know until we get them pushed to those points to be able to figure it out. But to make a long story short, when I was fighting, I didn't want there to be no question. So I made sure when I went in that ring that before I came out of there, you all knew who the best was. And to show you that, you can go look at the YouTube highlights right now of everybody, you're going to find one dude who your kid want to watch again. His name going to be Roy Jones Jr. Why? Because he fascinated you when he got in that ring. He didn't just beat the guy. He fascinated you while he beat the guy. While he was working on that guy's head, he was fascinated. you showing you things you've never seen before. So when you want to rise and top pound for pound, it's a little bit more than just boxing. And that's what they're not getting today. So I was highly offended. And he's my colleague, my friend. I love him like a brother. Jim Lampley, when he went and put Chuck Tito, number one pound pound. How? Who did he beat to become number one pound pound? What did he do to prove to us? I mean, yeah, he does look like an Aguayo clone, but Aguayo wasn't even number one pound pound in his time. He was a great fighter, don't get it wrong, but he was never a top pound for pound guy. So why did you, how do you go put 
his pupil who hasn't really took it no steps higher, and you put him in one of the pound five, what would he be to be number one? What did he show us? Skill-wise to be number one pound five. And sure enough, you did that, he got beat. Nothing to get, I love the kid to death too, but he wasn't number one pound five, you can't say that. He didn't do enough, he didn't show us enough. To be number one pound five in boxing, I can tell you. UFC, I can't tell you, because I'm not versed, well versed in all the different moves and all the different maneuvers and all the takedowns. I don't know about all of that yet. But boxing, I can tell you everything, pretty much. And I can tell you who got it in the way. <laughs> you understand me? So, pound pound is not something that's easily, it's not, it's, not, it's not a popularity contest. It should be about skills. And right now, the skills of the, of the active fighters, you gotta put Lomachenko up there and you gotta put Coffee. And you gotta put Triple G close by because he got good skills too. However, I'm gonna problem with Triple G being number one is because Canelo made him change the whole fight game. And he didn't dominate Canelo, so he can't be number one. While we're standing here, they just announced the rematch is on for Cinco de Mayo. They just announced the email. I know. So what, who do you favor in that rematch? I don't know. It's who gonna, who, who's gonna be able to make the adjustments? Like the second war, Kobe left fight, war made adjustments, Kobe left it. So it's all about who can make adjustments. That's when your corner comes into play. Because if you got a really good corner, they can help you make the adjustments necessary to change the outcome of that fight. If you don't have a good corner, then you'll see a, the same fight or you'll see what happened to Kovalev. You'll come with the same plan, but that plan won't work this time because the other guy changed his plan. Roy, it's obviously still got passion, so how hard is it to say this is it, man? It's, <laughs> it, it, you can tell the love is still there. Man, <laughs> it's, the love is there, but you know, it's like, like, like they said, the heart is with him, but the body can't take it too much more. You feel me? So the heart is with him, but the body ain't able. So you, know, you just gotta know that. Did Keep you ever that affect your mind? Did you ever see yourself at this age fighting when it started? Well, like I told you, I never saw myself at this age fight, but I also never saw myself as fighting for heavyweight title. So it's a lot of things that God put on my plate that I didn't expect to see. I never saw myself fighting on Uf UFC fight pants. Duh. <laughs> I never saw none of this coming. So how? Who am I to plan? So if I can't see what's coming for myself, how can I let somebody else tell me what I should do? You no, know, people say, oh, you should quit. You should, how y'all know? If I had quit when they said I should quit, I wouldn't be here right now today fighting the first boxing match on UFC fight pads, right? So you don't listen to people, you let God guide you. Let them people say what they want. They knew so much, they'd be doing it instead of you. Mm hmm? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? From everything you have accomplished in your career, which moment was the most special one? Ma'am, it's really hard to say which moment was the most special, and I thank God for that. And I'm not, it's not, nothing offensive to your question, but I thank God for it because there were so many beautiful moments <coughs> that it's hard to, for me to say which one was the best. The, the thing about the heavyweight, what makes it almost one of the best is because it's something beyond my imagination. I never imagined that I would fight for a heavyweight title. Never imagined that. So, quite naturally, that goes way up there, but at the same time, when you get a chance, to fight the best guy in your sport at the time. The best guy, the number one pound pound in your sport at the time, who they think can't be beat. And everybody tell you you can't beat him, and they bet against you. And you go out there and shut him down. That's a pretty good feeling too. So I don't know, <laughs> it's hard to say. And when you go out there and you fight a guy that's ranked number one, you gotta fight him. So you don't wanna fight him because you know he really to you ain't on your level, but you gotta fight him to keep your title, they gonna strip you. And you go out there and you put your hand behind your back, and you knock him out with your hand behind your back. Come on, man, who does that? You feel me? So it's a lot of moments that, I mean, a whole round with somebody who is as good as Vinny Pazianza and not get hit with a punch. A whole round with another legendary fighter and not get hit with a punch in the face, period. What about it? You know, there's so much to go back and look at that it's hard to say which one's the best. I did so much that it's just, it's hard to say what was the best for me. Roy, what would happen if you and Bernard met on a Saturday afternoon in that ring right behind you? I would beat him. I would beat him every day. Um, well, we got to take his promotional company out the equation, though. I got to. We got to be a, a neutral site, a neutral promotional company, so that he don't get to pick the referee and the judges. Then I kick his behind. But if go to work promotes it, I'm probably going to lose. <laughs> if he go twelve rounds, I'm probably going to lose. <laughs> Thanks, Roy. Yep. Thank you, Roy. Thanks, Roy. Thank you. Roy, I'm going to follow.